Ralph is the, the founder and president emeritus of World Missionary Assistance Plan. Uh, I think we all better know it as World Map. Uh, he's been publisher and senior editor of the World Map Digest and Axe Magazine, author and editor of The Shepherd's Staff, and author of many other articles and books. His ministry spans close to 50 years now, right? Yeah, and, and I've known him all my life. Um, if uh, you notice a family resemblance, it's because uh, he's my dad's cousin. And uh, I don't think he remembers this, but uh, I, I've mistaken him for my dad a couple of times when I was real little. I'd come up and, Dad, Dad, and look up and it was uh, Ralph. But uh, I read a really interesting description of him in an interview I got off the internet this week, and I'd like to share that with you. Like Amos of old, he was not a prophet, neither a prophet's son, but a gatherer of fruit. Please welcome Ralph Mahoney. Amen. Well, we're delighted to know that your pastor is in Africa today. Our heart has been in the nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America for the last 40-some uh, years. That has been our area of calling and uh, ministry. And I'm always happy to see others going out because the need is so great. If it was true in Jesus' time, it's far more true today. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are still few. And so thank the Lord for Carbon Canyon Church who's willing to release their pastor to go out to Africa. It's a continent in tremendous need and a continent with tremendous opportunity. Never in history has uh, that continent been so responsive to the gospel as it is today. And I know that uh, his time there will be a great blessing to the peoples to whom he ministers, and uh, he'll come back a changed man as well. You cannot visit the harvest fields of the world and see what God is doing without it having a great impact on you and changing your life and perspective forever. I uh, have great and profound appreciation for those who are called a pastor here in North America, but I must confess to you, I just am so thankful that was not my calling. very different from the peoples of third world nations in terms of their relationship to the Lord and to other issues in life and uh, I, I, my heart goes out to the pastors. They have a very tough job in this society, in this culture and I hope that you uh, hold your pastors up in much prayer, much support and with much appreciation because it's the toughest job on the world, in the world to probably to pastor a church here in the United States. If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, we're going to ask you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, and uh, verse 39. There's a little passage, a few words in that verse that I want to use as sort of the topic for what we want to share with you this morning. Uh, I after arriving, Brother Jim Rory told me that the um, uh, theme today was harvest, and so this will fit right in with that theme. It says in the middle of verse 39, the harvest is the end of the age. If you have a more recent translation, if you still have the old King James, why it says the harvest is the end of the world. But Jesus wasn't talking about the world coming to an end, that is the planet on which we live, or the peoples on the planet. He was talking about an age, of the church age. And the harvest would come at the end of the age. And we're going to look at that today, the harvest at the end of the age. Father, we bow our hearts in your presence, thanking you for this opportunity to speak to your people today. We pray there will come an impartation of faith to embrace the tremendous thing that you're doing today all over the world by your Spirit. And that, Lord, we'll be joined to you in your purpose in making your last command our first priority. Your last command to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let it become the first priority of every Christian all over the world till we see the great task of world evangelism finished and completed as you promised it would be before you return to earth again. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll impart vision and faith to us today to believe to see the glory of the Lord in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Before we get into uh, our comments on this passage, I just wanted to, uh, again, express appreciation to the Roaring family. George is a first cousin. His mother and my mother were sisters, and uh, I owe a great deal personally, and our whole family does, to the Roaring family. We were in Florida when the Great Depression hit, and it hit Florida 
hard enough to leave everybody absolutely flat broke. My father owned a 22-acre farm near Ocala, Florida, on which I was born in 1932. I was the sixth of seven children that would ultimately be born in our family. And the year I was born, he had less than $200 cash income. And that would give you some idea of the state of the economy at that time. The 22-acre farm in which he had invested over $8,000, 1920s dollars, uh, you couldn't give it away because if you owned property, you had to pay the tax on the property. And nobody would even take the gift of land or farms or ranches or anything because once you owned it, you were liable for the taxes. And so he couldn't even give it away. And in fact, finally sold it in 1944 for $400 after the economy recovered and after the war was almost over. And so uh, Florida was very, very hard hit. And uh, the only thing that sort of salvaged our family in terms of getting us out of that impoverished situation was that in 1935, 36, uh, the then President Roosevelt voted all the veterans of World War I who had seen combat duty a pension. They were given actually a one-time cash grant. And my father, who had seen action in World War I, was eligible for that uh, grant. And when he received it, he used it to pack up his family and relocate them to the western part of the United States where there was work and jobs and an economy that was intact enough to where you could find a job. And so when we arrived here, we arrived, of course, the, the perennial flat broke family of the Depression years and the Roarigs took us in for almost a whole summer of 1936. And I guess we would have been uh, camping out all that summer apart from uh, Joe Roarig's uh, gracious uh, mom and dad and that uh, family and George's, of course, mom and dad. So uh, thanks, Joe, and thanks to your parents and your family for putting up with us for most of that summer. We, uh, we were uh, really saved by that act of kindness and uh, finally were able to relocate to Arizona in the latter part of that summer in August uh, where my mother began teaching school and my father found a job uh, helping build the, the dams that irrigate Arizona today. And that uh, sort of was the turnaround in the economy of our family. So we know what it is to be... Uh, to be without much in the way of resource in terms of financial resource. The younger generation, of course, has not experienced any of those kind of traumatic economic events. But let me tell you, the nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, most of them continue to live in those conditions and far, far worse. And have never known anything different because of the corruption generally is the reason for most of the nation's woes. Corruption of leadership and uh, they desperately need the gospel and need the transforming power of the gospel to make these nations viable for their people. And so uh, thank the Lord that there's great power in, in the gospel, power in the blood of the Lamb, power in the saving grace of Christ to transform nations. Go therefore and disciple all nations. And keep in mind that is the commission to make nations, make a change in the nations of the world. And I'm sure most of you are aware the word nations doesn't just refer to a geopolitical entity like India, for example, which we call a nation. But within <clears throat> nations, in the biblical concept, there's over 3,000 nations. Because in the biblical concept, a nation is an ethnic group, not a geopolitical entity that has defined the geographic boundaries. It's an ethnic group which have a unique language and culture that make them different from anybody else in the world. Within India, there are over 3,000 such ethnic groups. Some of them are large, like the Hindi, the Tamil, the Malayalam, the uh, Bengali, and on and on. We could name those language groups and uh, ethnic groups of India. And uh, all of them need to be reached with the gospel, every ethnic group. When we look at the world as a group of ethnicity, we see over 13,000 ethnic groups. When we look at it as a group of geopolitical entities, we have uh, oh, only a few over 200. Last count I had, I think it was 225 that the United Nations recognized geopolitical entities. But in those 225 what we call nations, such as Russia or the United States or Canada or India or China or whatever, you want to call a nation, within them there are over 13,000 different linguistic groups who have unique cultural milieu that makes them different from everybody else. And the commission is to go to all of those nations and bring the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. 
And when you read the book of Revelation, it's wonderful to see that when we all get to heaven, there are those there praising the Lord according to what John the Revelator saw out of every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. That means somebody finished the job of world evangelism. And that somebody, I believe, is the current generation that we are living in. And we're going to try to give you some supporting t uh, information on that today. Because the, um, the harvest is the end of the age. And that is the time we're living in, the end of the church age. So we're going to take a look here, uh, if we can, and hopefully uh, these transparencies will project where you can see them. Any of you that are on this side that want to see better, feel free just to slip on over a little bit uh, and uh, maybe they'll be a little more visible to you. Then we're going to get back uh, into the, uh, the word here. Jim showed me how to use this before the service, so I'll see if I can uh, do it. Is it all right if I, uh, what do I need to do, push it a little closer? Or I guess we can get it all on there, all right. That, of course, was the commission as recorded in Matthew chapter 28. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And what we're depicting here, of course, is all these various ethnic groups of the world. I want to go back now, though, for a couple hundred years to the beginning of what's called the modern missionary era. This is the world of 1780 in terms of the evangelicals, the born-again believers in that world. And the yellow areas that you see on this map represent those places in the world where 200 years ago there were evangelical believers, born-again believers. And you can see that there were just a very, very small area of the world in uh, 1780 or 1800 thereabouts that had any uh, born-again believers in them. If we trace the growth of the born-again community in the world from 1800 till 1980, it would look something like this. Uh, in 1800, you had 99% of the born-again believers in the Western nations. That's represented by this uh, here. 1% of the born-again believers were in the nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. That's when the modern missionary era began, the 1800s. That's when uh, Carey went from England out to, uh, to India. William Carey, a very, very famous missionary. We celebrated the 200th uh, anniversary of his coming to India several years ago. So he went out in the, actually the late uh, 1700s. Uh, and uh, arrived there uh, in uh, India and uh, spent the rest of his life there and did a great and notable work for the Lord. He translated the Bible into the Hindi and some of the other Indian dialects, Hindi language and some of the other dialects. And uh, this is the, the, the century in which J. Hudson Taylor went out to China from India and later uh, recruited over 900 missionaries to follow him into China to evangelize the interior of China. And J. Hudson Taylor called his organization the China Inland Mission. And the reason he called it China Inland Mission was because in those years, the very little missionary effort being done and practically none was being done uh, by evangelicals or Protestants or those who were of the Reformation stream. Uh, almost zero missionary work was being done, but those that did any kind of missionary work typically went to the seacoast cities for reasons of a nice climate, prosperous seaports where there was a lot of trade and conveniences and you could buy just about anything you wanted, lovely homes that had been built and the colonial, colonialists, of course, were out all over the world by that time. And if you go to many of these cities today, which we have these last uh, 40 years, you'll see the beautiful remnants of gorgeous homes that were built in the 1800s, 1900s, uh, in which the colonialists lived. And the missionaries, of course, would congregate to those centers, centers of prosperity and affluence, just as they still do today, unfortunately. For example, if you go to Japan, you'll find that more than 80% of the missionaries are in Tokyo. And if you go a few hundred miles from Tokyo, you can still find Japanese who know little or nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard for us to understand a nation as technologically advanced as Japan has become that they're totally outside the reach of the gospel in many parts of that nation still today. And uh, so the point being that, that missionaries tend to gravitate toward the prosperous centers, the comfortable centers of the world. And that's unfortunate. J. Hudson Taylor said, no, if you join this mission, you've got to go inland. You've got to get away from the prosperous coastal cities and go to the great interior of China uh, to the peoples who don't have the gospel. And so he called it the China 
Inland Mission. Later, the Sudan Interior Mission was formed. And all uh, uh, across Europe, uh, missionary organizations all sprung up with the same emphasis that J. Hudson Taylor had on reaching the inland people, the interior people, the people who were out in the areas where they were outside the reach of the gospel. But uh, that resulted in a tremendous change, of course. Uh, whenever you start investing in the harvest, what happens uh, in your own homeland or in your own church? Just what we see on this graph, these, the, the size of these blocks represent growth in terms of the number of uh, believers. So you see from 1800 to 1900, the evangelical community grew tremendously in Western nations, but uh, they represented 91% of the believers, the born-again believers, had, but you had a 900% growth in, uh, in the uh, nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. They, they came from 1% up to 9% of the total of believers. Then something happened at the turn of this century, and that was, of course, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that began uh, as far as uh, we can trace it, to uh, Topeka, Kansas, to Brother Parham's Bible School, where the Holy Spirit fell uh, on the actual New Year's Eve of 1899-1900. And uh, Brother Parham and others who were baptized in the Spirit and were speaking with tongues uh, went out traveling uh, uh, <clears throat> within a matter of months after that event. And uh, one of the uh, places where Brother Parham went was to Houston, Texas, where he was preaching uh, in a church there. And a dear black brother by the name of William Seymour came to those meetings and heard uh, Pastor Parham uh, teaching on the baptism in the Holy Spirit and was himself baptized in the Spirit. And dear brother Seymour came to Los Angeles about 1904-05 and they started a prayer meeting on Bonnie Bray Street which is up near where Angeles Temple is, Echo Park area of Los Angeles. And out of that prayer meeting was birthed the, what we know today as the Azusa Street Mission. And for three years in the Azusa Street Mission, dear Brother Seymour, who was just a sweet, humble brother, dear black brother from uh, the South. In fact, when he went to the meetings in those years in Houston, he wasn't even allowed inside the church because of the segregation policies that were in place in the South then. Uh, but despite that discrimination, he was hungry for God, and he went and he sat outside, heard the messages, was baptized in the Holy Spirit came to Los Angeles and joined a prayer group here and opened the Azusa Street Mission and the Spirit began to fall. And they were coming from South Africa and uh, other parts of Africa, from India, from all across the United States, Canada, and the world to the Azusa Street Mission. And this dear brother Seymour only had an orange crate for a pulpit. And he would simply kneel and put his head inside the orange crate and pray. He didn't do a lot of teaching and preaching, but he did a lot of praying. And while he was praying, the Spirit would be falling and people would be getting healed and people would be getting filled with the Holy Spirit and they would go back to their countries and tell the glorious news of what God was doing. Joel 2.28 was being fulfilled again. God was pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. And as these Spirit-filled believers begin going all over the world, there accompanied their ministries the signs and wonders we read about in the book of Acts. The sick were being healed, the dead were being raised, blind eyes were being opened, deaf were hearing, and this caused the pagan peoples of the world to begin to turn to Christ in unprecedented numbers. And because of that great outpouring of the Spirit that began in the Azusa Street Mission and back in Topeka and other places around the world, uh, we saw tremendous growth in the years uh, uh, following 1900, especially overseas. And look what happened by 1980 there had been a phenomenal growth in the church in the nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America uh, in the 20th century. Now, if you look at the world after that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, it was a very different world from the world of 1800. Uh, the world of 1980 looks something like this, and it's even more spectacular today. But uh, look at those areas of the world. That's the areas of the world where there were evangelical believers to 180 years after the modern missionary movement started. How many of you know that if you, if you go out to where the fish are, you can catch them? Uh, we think we're going to catch them inside the sanctuary. If you want to reach sinners, you're not going to get them saved here. You've got to go where the fish are to, to, to fish. And if you're going to reach sinners, where do you go? You go out where the sinners are. If you're going to see nations turn to Christ, you have to go to those nations. Paul asked uh, four questions in Romans chapter 10. Questions that every one of us need to answer. How can they believe on Him of whom they've not heard? Did you understand the question? 
If they've never heard, how are they going to believe on Jesus? Second question Paul asks, how can they hear without a preacher, without someone to tell them? They can't, obviously. And how are they going to preach unless someone sends them? How many of you know those are the three steps that are necessary to win the lost for Christ, to reach the unevangelized? They have to hear, and they can't hear without a preacher, and the preacher can't go unless someone sends the preacher. And so there was a notice I noticed on your video here today about uh, special offerings for Pastor Kinzer to help cover the expenses. He needs someone to help send. And you can, if you can't be a going missionary, you can certainly be a praying missionary, and you can certainly be a sending missionary in the sense you support those who go. And we can make extra sacrifices to ensure that uh, Christ's last command is fulfilled to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Well, what you see on this map is the result of thousands of missionaries who went out from 1800 till 1980 all over the world and laid down their lives literally for the cause of Christ. If you go to West Africa today, as I have ministered in many of those West African countries, West Africa was particularly uh, uh, difficult for Westerners. When the missionaries would come down from England or Europe to West Africa, in six months, in one, one group, a uh, hundred missionaries were sent out by the uh, London Mission to uh, one of the West African countries back in the 1800s. Six months later, only one survivor. The diseases and all to which the African indigenous people had immunity, the Westerners had no immunity. They would arrive and they would just start dying. And thousands planted their lives in the soil of Africa to bring forth the tremendous harvest we're seeing in Africa today. You remember that Jesus said that uh, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if the grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it brings forth much fruit. And the fruitfulness of harvest in any nation is in direct proportion to the number of lives that have been planted in that nation seeking to reach the people for Christ. And those missionaries did not die in vain even though their lives were cut short by disease and hardships and sometimes violence which they faced and sometimes the end of a sword or a knife or whatever else, they still, their life counted for harvest. They were planted in the soil of that nation and became uh, that seed that could bring forth fruit in later years. And when you go to those uh, graveyards in East, uh, West Africa rather, and you, you look at the tombstones and you see how young many of them were, most of them under age 22, 23, and how they had gone out to give their life in loving uh, sacrifice for these people and yet died within a matter of days or months after arriving on those shores. And they continued to come despite the fact that those reports would get back to England. The more that would die and perish, the more they would send. And what sacrifices were made to produce this tremendous harvest. And of course, it bespeaks the need for us today to continue in the mode of those early pioneers to be willing to make the sacrifices if we're to see the job of world evangelism completed. Some of you may know a famous story that comes out of the, uh, uh, the Moravian movement. There was a man in, uh, in what is today Eastern Europe by the name of Count Van Zinzendorf he lived back in the 1700s, uh, the same era as John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. Count van Zinzendorf was a prince who had a fiefdom, would be the term I think used today to describe it, um, a small little fiefdom in Eastern Europe in a, a community called Hernhut. And in the Hernhut community, it became a refuge for evangelicals in Europe in those years. He opened up his fiefdom and welcomed any persecuted Christian who wanted to come because in those years it was quite common for the established church, uh, which uh, happened to be the Catholic Church, to kill the Protestants or to kill the evangelicals particularly. And so uh, he established a place where they could flee from this persecution and from being killed and uh, provide a haven. And so in the space of time, several thousand uh, different evangelicals fled to Hernhut for, for sanctuary. And uh, during their time there, a, a prayer meeting started. A visitation of God came upon these people 
And uh, that part of Europe was known as Moravia, and hence the name Moravians. And uh, when this prayer meeting started, uh, it, it, it's, it, it created a tremendous intercessory ministry in the community where people wanted to pray day and night. And to make a long story short, that prayer meeting that was precipitated by a visitation of the Holy Spirit, that prayer meeting lasted 100 years, 24 hours a day. Prayer never ceased in Hernhut, in Moravia. And out of that community was birthed the modern missionary movement. The Moravians were the very first ones to begin sending out missionaries in terms of evangelical Christians and Protestant Christians. None of the other groups were sending them, even before Carey went and before uh, J. Hudson Taylor and before David Livingston went down to Africa. Long before that, the Moravians were sending out their young people and sometimes their older people as missionaries to reach the unreached peoples of the world. And one uh, story was particularly touching among the Moravians that I want to share with the young people here today. Two young men was, were reading about uh, conditions down in the Caribbean. And in those years, slavery was still very much in vogue in much of this hemisphere. And in the Caribbean islands, there were many of the islands where almost the total population were African slaves. And they heard of this one, Africa, uh, this one uh, island uh, in the Caribbean, which there were 40,000 African slaves, no one to bring the gospel to them. And the owners of that island would not allow anyone to even set foot on the island unless they went there as a slave. And so these young men were so compelled by the Holy Spirit and the compassion of the Lord to go to reach those 40,000 with the gospel. And so finally they made the decision. They went to the company that owned the island. They said, the only way you can go is to become slaves. They said, all right, we will become slaves. And so they signed away all their rights to freedom, sold themselves voluntarily into slavery, and as they were sailing away from the port in Germany, from which they sailed to that island and spent the rest of their life and died there as slaves, their last words as they were going out to sea were, we go to gain for the Lamb the reward of His sacrifice. Jesus died for all the peoples of the world. And the only way that sacrifice is going to be effective in gaining the reward of that sacrifice is to go to the people that need the gospel and preach the gospel and win them to Christ, and thus that death will not be in vain. His death on the cross will not be in vain. We will go to gain for the Lamb the reward of His sacrifice. And that became a motto of the Moravian movement, to gain for the Lamb the reward of His sacrifice. Any of you who visited our world map camps, which we conducted for some 29 years here on the west coast of the United States, will know that we always had a banner up above a map of the world behind our platform. And on that banner was that Moravian motto, to gain for the Lamb the reward of His sacrifice. That too was our calling not at the expense of those two young Moravian lads who left uh, Germany with all its comforts and protections and blessings and went out to a slave island to labor among a people who had no chance of hearing the gospel, a people whose traditions were steeped in uh, worship of demons and shamanism, as it's called sometimes in North America by the anthropologists today, or in witchcraft, if some of you know that, uh, some of the other pagan religions of Africa. Uh, here they go into the middle of that whole cauldron of misery and suffering and lay down their lives to gain for the Lamb the reward of His sacrifice. I first went to the east coast of Nicaragua in 1959, and there was a people known as the Mosquito, M-I-S-K-I-T-O, not the bug M-O-S-Q-U-I-T-O, not a mosquito insect, but Mosquito, M-I-S-K-I-T-O, Mosquito Indian people. And the Moravians had come to that coast in the 1880s with the gospel. And interesting, interestingly, among the Mosquito peoples, they had prophetesses and prophets that had arisen among them in centuries past who foretold of a day when white men would come with a black book. And when they came, they would be able to tell them who their true Redeemer and Savior was.
The Mosquito were not a polytheistic people. They were not uh, idolaters in the sense of worshiping many gods. They were uh, a monotheistic people. They believed in one creator God, but they didn't know who, know who he was. And they also knew about a serpent killer that would come, based, of course, on the ancient uh, record of uh, Genesis 3. But they didn't know much more, but they knew a serpent killer would come who would kill the serpent, whom they understood to be the evil one. And that serpent killer would be their savior and redeemer. And they had been waiting for his coming. And it wasn't until 1880s that the Moravian missionaries finally arrived on that coast and said, the serpent killer has come. And they almost, the whole of the mosquito people, because of the prophecies they had received uh, from their own prophets and prophetesses over the years of the coming of white men with a black book, they immediately received them as the fulfillment of that and turned to Christ and almost all of them became Christian and were born again. When we arrived there in 1959, unfortunately, uh, 60, 70 years of... Uh, of extension of, uh, of, of, of the gospel being planted there. What had started out in life and blessing and a move of the Holy Spirit had uh, unfortunately deteriorated to a point where they were just going through a form and ritual of religion. Uh, as Paul described it in his letter to Timothy, a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Moffat translates it having the form without the force. And that was the unfortunate condition of the Mosquito peoples in 1959 when we arrived. They had the forms of religion, the forms of Christianity, but they were not practicing their faith. And they, uh, they, they had no force, they had no power. They were in tremendous bondages to uh, addictions to alcohol and um, immorality and other things that uh, they needed deliverance. Even though they called themselves Christian, they, they were just carrying on a sort of a, a form of a former power. When I went out in the villages in the interior of eastern Nicaragua, I would find some of the old, old uh, Nicaraguan Mosquito Indian women and men who remembered the early days of the church. And they would tell me the stories of the healings and the miracles that had come when the first Moravian missionaries arrived. But they hadn't seen it in 40, 50 years. But they could remember it. And we came, of course, telling them that Jesus came to forgive your sins and heal your diseases and uh, to change your life and break you free from the addictions to alcohol and betel nut and uh, the other addictions that they were slaves to. And they believed what we preached and God poured out a profusion of miracles upon them that I've never seen before or since the likes of. Almost everyone we touched was immediately healed by the power of the Lord. And it was a miraculous uh, uh, era of years of just revival that brought that group of uh, uh, mosquito Indian people back to the Lord and the power in which they had been birthed some 80 years before. And a glorious time for us, but I was so thankful that I had had a part in helping recover a valley of dry bones. A people who had received the gospel some 80 years before we arrived and yet uh, had become a valley of dry bones. They had had the life of God but had lost it. And now all there was was just the bones. Well, the Lord enabled us to become a resurrection voice to them. Oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And they came forth and began to bone to his bone. God put flesh and sinew on them, and they became a mighty force to evangelize that whole east coast of Nicaragua. And I could go on by the hours to tell you the stories of what God did using the Mosquito Indian young men and, and women to evangelize their own people those whom we trained and who were converted, who saw the power of God and manifestation in those years. But you see, this great expansion of the gospel came at great expense and great price. And I can tell you it still will not, the job of world evangelism will not be finished apart from those who are willing to still pay that price. I remember 1959 before I went to Nicaragua. The Spirit of the Lord came in a Sunday morning service in a church that we had pioneered and were pastoring there in uh, Louisiana, which, which, which is where we were in those years. The word of the Lord came, ask largely of the Lord, ask largely of the Lord, and it came in four or five prophecies in the meeting. And God was really there. We were having a very, very sovereign visitation of God at that time. And God was in the place. People were coming in from surrounding states, and it's a long story, but uh, we were just in a time when God was showing up every meeting in great power. And in that Sunday morning, as the prophecies kept coming, ask largely of the Lord. I stood there, and I was just, uh, the only prayer that could come into my heart was, uh, 
Psalm 2, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So I said, Lord, that's what I'm asking. That's the largest thing I can think of. Give me the nations for my inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth. And the Lord answered that prayer. But I want to tell you that that prayer was the most expensive prayer I ever prayed. There were dozens of times in the 40 years uh, that have now followed, 42 years that have now followed, when I'd have loved to have been able to sort of say, Lord, take it all back. <laughs> because there's a great price to pay in going out to fulfill the commission of reaching the unreached peoples of the earth with the gospel. The gospel is not going forward in parts of the earth, not for lack of money, although money is necessary. And we express our faith by our giving and giving is a very vital part of world evangelism. But I want to tell you that it's not for lack of money. There's plenty of money in the world. Billions and billions and billions stashed up in religious organizations, especially in Europe and even here in America. That is not being used. It's just sitting there. The money's there. What's, what's lacking? What's lacking is the commitment and the willingness to sacrifice and lay down our lives for Christ. I can take an impoverished people, as we have been doing now the last 30-some years, in any nation of the world who have nothing financially, and with the right teaching, raise them up a mighty army for God where they will go out and lay down their lives for Christ without any money. I just returned from China three weeks ago, I believe it was. We've been doing a fair amount of work in China over the last, uh, since 1988, the Lord laid it on my heart when I met with house church leaders in 1988 to do something to try to help the church in China. Church in China is a very amazing story of 20th century evangelism. J. Hudson Taylor was used of God to lay most of the foundations for the evangelical movement in China. And thank God for him and the other 900 or so missionaries that went out under his and, and, and of many other organizations. But Many of you know that uh, China was taken over by the communists in 1950. The missionaries had been in China since the 1820s, so there'd been about 130 years of missionary endeavor in the modern era in China. Whenever the missionaries went, they took Western forms of Christianity with them, and that's not untypical. Most missionaries export their culture, not the gospel. And what the people of the world need is not our culture, they need our Christ. And unfortunately, we don't take just Christ, we take our culture and Christ, and we try to impose it upon them and have them do things the way we would do it here in the West. And uh, it just will not work for reasons I do not have time to explain this morning. The economics of third world nations absolutely prohibit Western Christianity from succeeding as it is practiced here in the West. Actually, much of what we do is based in our links to our Catholic uh, heritage. We all came somewhere back in our, gene in our spiritual genealogy from either the Catholic or the Orthodox Church. And so much of what was in that stream that was not right, was not biblical, we still practice and we still do. And uh, it will, as far as I can see, never be purged from the church in the West until the Lord comes. But it's there and it's a tremendous inhibition to the spread of the gospel. The four, three things that prevent the gospel going forth are, are, are very easily uh, identified from my observation of being in these nations now for the last 43 years it is, ministering and evangelizing in over 150 nations of the world now. But from my observation, it's very easy to identify the three things that prevent the gospel from spreading very, very quickly. Three things basically are, first of all, a absence of the knowledge and power of the Holy Spirit. If you were to want to express that in uh, theological terms, uh, there's some fancy words that theologians have. They call it pneumatological deficiencies. Pneuma is the Greek word for spirit, and so they use pneumatological, meaning the study and knowledge of the Spirit, deficiencies of the study and knowledge of the Holy Spirit. You go to most seminaries today in the world, you'll find that they will have lots of volumes on Christology, all kinds of volumes on God the Father, but practically nothing, if anything, on the work and power of the Holy Spirit. That's still true in the seminaries. Now, it's not true in the church worldwide, uh, as we'll see here in a few moments. But the point being, pneumatological deficiencies or the absence of the knowledge and power of the Holy Spirit hinder the evangelization of the world. 
We cannot go into all the world and preach the gospel without the signs following and have any success. If we don't heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, do the things that were part of that commission as recorded in Mark 16, we will not see much impact of the gospel in third world nations. Now, I'm not saying the same thing holds true here in the United States, uh, and I'm not saying it holds true in every nation. I, I know there are some exceptions. The Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek wisdom. So different peoples respond to different things. There are some people who are like the Greeks, and you will not reach them with signs and wonders. But most are like the Jews. They require a sign before they will believe. And so until that is part of the gospel you take, you will not make an impact. Paul said, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, both with signs, wonders, miracles, and divers gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The gospel is not fully preached until those things accompany it. And so what Jesus told us was this gospel of the kingdom that's a different gospel than is preached in much of the world, by the way. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. Now, people ask me, when's the Lord coming? He's coming when the gospel of the king's dominion, the kingdom, is preached in all the world for a witness to every ethnic group. Then the end will come, and it won't come before that. You can buy all of uh, Lindsay's books you want, but he's not going to come before this gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. That's simple eschatology. The gospel preached in all the world, to every nation, and then the end comes. That's my eschatology. That's Jesus' eschatology. That should be yours. And if you really want the Lord to come, what will you be doing? you'll be preaching the gospel to all nations because he's not going to come till that happens. So that uh, lack of, the, of preaching the gospel of the king's dominion, the king's power, a gospel of power, if, if that's not the gospel you preach, you're not going to make an impact. So the, you have to have that. And that, that began, of course, in, this, in the 1900s with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Second thing, of course, is very, uh, again, very obvious. It's the cathedral concept. And uh, in the United States and uh, Western nations, the, you know, most Christians think the Great Commission is go into all the world and build cathedrals for every creature. But you have no idea the enormous economic impact that makes. I see these poor Indian pastors labor 25, 30 years. Now, I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you the way it is in the villages of India where there is hardly any financial resource, if any. Some of them don't have money as we know it. They have other ways of, of, of trading and so on. But anyway, they'll spend 25, 30 years because some Western missionary modeled that for them to, to get up a little building with some concrete block walls, a little tin roof. But they're so impoverished it can take 25, 30 years of their life to raise up that little simple building. Is that what the gospel's all about, building buildings? It has nothing to do with building buildings. The early church won the, the world for Christ, reached their world for Christ in 40, 50 years. And as far as the archaeologists can tell, there was never a church building constructed until the 300s. The first two centuries of the church, when they evangelized their world, there was no church building going on. How did they do it? They just met in homes and whatever was available, small fellowships of 50, 75, 100 people. And that kept the cost of spreading the gospel down to where there was no cost, other than just the support of those that were doing the teaching and preaching, and many of those were self-supporting. So the economics of building cathedrals absolutely stops the gospel dead in its tracks. The third thing, of course, that contributes to this whole uh, thing of spreading the gospel is what, the, again, the theologians call clericalism. A clergy class and a priest class. Now in the New Testament, there was no clergy class. There were leaders. There were five leadership gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. There were elders, deacons, and so on. Leadership gifts were there, but there was no clergy, no laity. Those are not biblical terms. They're not in your Bible because there was no such thing. The New Testament concept was expressed in Peter's first epistle, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. 
where Peter said, you are a kingdom of priests. Meaning every believer is a priest, called to a priestly ministry. And every Protestant church almost has within their theological statement the, the, the doctrine of what the reformers call the priesthood of every believer. When the Reformation started about five centuries ago, they were attacking the existing church system where you had a priest class and a laity class. The Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church were structured very simply. At the top was the Pope, under which were the cardinals and, uh, who were also bishops, under which were the priests, under which were the people. And the cardinals had to kiss the Pope's ring, meaning they were swearing allegiance and obedience to him. And the priests have to kiss the bishop's ring to swear obedience and allegiance to him. And the people, in effect, have to kiss the priest's ring to swear allegiance and obedience to him. It's a military structure, only four levels deep. Very simple, very effective if you want a large structure. But the problem is you only have about one priest for every 200 people. Now you can't win a war when you only mobilize one out of 200 people to be involved as a soldier. God's plan was for all his people to be priests. And that was the doctrine of the priesthood of every believer that the reformers taught and preached. And some had their heads cut off, many were burned at the stake, uh, uh, and so on, for preaching and teaching that. That every believer has priestly calling upon his life. Every believer is called to minister first of all to the Lord which we had a short time of doing that at the beginning of the service in our worship and in prayer. Every believer's call to a ministry to other believers where we share with others who are in need financially or in need sociologically or whatever. We minister to one another. That's part of our priestly ministry. And every believer is also called to a ministry to the world, to the unbelieving world. So every believer has a ministry to the Lord, to one another, and to the world as their obligation. Now, most aren't taught that. Most don't do that, and it's not practiced, but that hinders the spread of, world, of, of the gospel. It hinders world evangelism because we don't mobilize the troops to go out and fight the battle. We give the assignment to a few generals, but generals don't win wars. It's the troops that win the war. And that has hindered the gospel. Those three things, well, going back to China, what happened? 1950, the communists take over. What do they do? Well, first of all, they throw all the clergy out, that is the foreign clergy, the missionaries. And when they did, everybody said the church in China is finished. Little did they know. The next thing they did is lock up all the preachers trained by them. Because most of those preachers had been trained in seminaries that were opposed to the work and power of the Holy Spirit. It was a good thing that they got locked up in jail for a while. Because when the Spirit would begin to move in China with those first generation missionaries and those clergy trained by them, what's the first reaction? When God starts moving by His Spirit and people don't know about the moving of the Holy Spirit, what do they say? They say, it's the devil. And so like the children of Israel, as the psalmist said, they hinder the Holy One of Israel. How many of you know you can quench the Holy Spirit? You can hinder God. You can be a hindrance. And clergy usually are a hindrance. Now, thank God there's some exceptions. But the point being that by getting all those clergymen locked up and all the missionaries thrown out, it removed that obstacle to the Holy Spirit being able to move. He, there was no clergy, so what happened in China? The same thing that happened in the New Testament. The, it's what we call layman, the, the, the common believer, took up the job and task of evangelism. And that's the way it was done, of course, in New Testament times, as I will show you here in just a moment. So the clergy were locked up. That solved the problem of clericalism. The communists took away all their church buildings, their cathedrals. So that solved the problem of having to pour all that money into the buildings, which poor people don't have. We've got money to burn in America, money to waste, so it doesn't, it's such a critical issue here. But in these countries, they don't have it. In China today, the average uh, worker would, might, might get $25, $30 a month in income. 
And at that level of, of, an econo of an economy, you cannot support the lavish kinds of things that Christians uh, have just, you just take for granted here in America. So when you can get rid of those things and get their focus on something else, they can become very effective. So we get rid of the missionaries, we get rid of the clergy, we get rid of the cathedrals. And then, of course, who's going to do the job? It's going to go down to the priesthood of every believer level. And that's what happened in China. The laymen began taking up the responsibility. And when the Holy Ghost would move, they didn't know any better than to let him move. People were getting healed, they'd just let them get healed. If people were getting, wanting to come and get saved, they would say, they'd get saved and they'd baptize them. And they just let God begin to be God and God begin to work. When the communists took over China in 1950, there were three million Protestants and Catholics, about a million and a half of each. After 120 years of missionary endeavor, doing it the Western way, Today in China, I can tell you on good authority that every year, more than three million Chinese are coming to Christ. Absent clericalism, absent cathedrals, with the priesthood of every believer being reinforced, with every Chinese being mobilized to win the lost at any cost. My last trip in China, which was just three weeks ago, I was meeting with a group from a seminary who came 14 hour train ride down to the border area of where I was at to secretly meet with me at jeopardy of being imprisoned. They wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit and take it back to their 400 seminary students. All over China today there's a hunger for the work and power of the Spirit. This, these were three self church people. I don't know if you know about the three self church in China. But the Three Self Church is the church that the communist government sanctions and allows because they register their churches. And unfortunately, they control much of what they do, the communists. They're, but that's the small movement in China. The big movement in China is the house church movement, as it's called. And it's all being led by laymen who just take up the responsibility of taking the gospel to their own people and winning, them at any, winning the lost at any cost. I was in China... 1996, way in the interior, they smuggled me into a mountain area to meet with uh, a, a group of key house church leaders. Let me go back for a moment to 1988 and then I'll come back to 1996. When I met with the house church leaders in 1988, they were already some 40, 50, maybe 60 million strong across China. Among them, there were about 300,000 house church leaders and I met with a key group of them, and I asked them, what can we do to help you in your mission and work in China? And they said, well, Brother Ralph, almost all of us as leaders have Bibles. Our people don't have Bibles. Only about one in 70 believer has, believers have a Bible in China because the communists will not allow the free distribution of, of the Bibles. And so many of the believers, most of the believers, do not have a Bible. They covet a Bible. Some of them will hand copy almost the entire Bible to be able to have the Scriptures. And you'll see handwritten copies of the Bible. They're very, very thick, of course, because the paper is thick that they write on. They don't have Bible paper, and they can't do it in small print. So they end up with these huge, huge books that they've written out a copy of the Bible. Would you write the entire Bible down to have a copy of it? Most of us have five, six, seven, eight of them in our possession if we've been believers any length of time. But in China, not many have Bibles, not many believers, but the leaders do. They always ensure their leader gets a Bible if there's one in the group. So I said, well, what is it that we can do to help you? They said, Brother Ralph, we desperately need training material to train ourselves and to equip our workers. So I went back home and I spent three years, almost day and night, putting together what I had accumulated over 30 years of leadership training, a book, and it's called The Shepherd's Staff. And it's in three sections. The first part is 28 lessons that need to be taught every new believer, done by Paul Collins. Some of you might know him of Australia. The second part is a topical concordance where they can look up any topic and have all the Bible references and a little commentary on it. That was done by a man who had been a nuclear physicist in Canada a hippie nuclear physicist who got saved, filled the Holy Ghost, went to Africa as a missionary. Brilliant guy. 
He and his wife are out there serving today as missionaries in Africa. And he put this together for the African leaders. And I saw it, and it was a really well done topical concordance. Met the need. We enhanced it a little bit. That was included. Then, of course, the leadership training guide, which is this much of the book. All the principles a leader needs to know to be able to carry on a ministry and win the lost and plant churches and so on. And these are from authors all over the world. African authors, Asian authors, Indian authors, English authors, Australian authors. I just ga I gathered over the years the best I could find in all these different countries. And we put it together and organized it into a curriculum so that they have a Bible school and a book. And uh, so we, we prepared this. It took three years, half million words, a lot of work, working day and night on it. I just thought I never wanted to see a computer again when I got finished with it. We first translated into Chinese. That was the first language edition. It's now in 16 languages. And as of now, 150,000 of the house church leaders have a copy. Another 200,000 are still waiting, but it's a very cumbersome process to get them into China and get them distributed because of the arrests and all the harassment that are, those involved uh, get into. And some have got, many have gone to jail for being involved with helping us get these into China and get them distributed. So it's not without its risks. But what I wanted to get back to is that today in China, where it took the Protestant Western Church and the Catholic Western Church approach to missions, 120 years to get 3 million believers today, these house church leaders go out, laymen, and are winning over 3 million a year to Christ across China today in one year. Which is the more effective way? The Western Church way with our cathedrals and our clergy and our opposition to the work and power of the Spirit or the Bible way? Which is to take the message through lay people who will share their faith. No need for fancy facilities. They don't have the money to afford them to begin with. And no clergy just go out and everybody becomes a laborer in the harvest. Obviously, China proves the Bible way is the most effective way. I want to just give you a couple of stories here in closing. In 1996, when they smuggled me into the interior mountains of China, we were up in an area where the people all live in caves. I didn't realize millions of people in China live in caves today. They're too impoverished to afford or have anything else. And so they just go to these steep mountain areas, especially the Christians, to escape persecution. And the mountains are really steep, and they'll just dig a, you know, a, a level off a place like this, very steep mountainside. They'll just make a cut into it, dig a hole back into it about 40 feet. It'll be maybe 8, 9 feet high and maybe 15, 20 feet wide, and it'll just be sort of an arch shape. And they just dig a hole back in the mountain, put a, a facade on the front to keep the cold out in the winter and the heat out in the summer, and they live back in that cave. And it actually is quite uh, comfortable because the ground temperatures are much warmer in the winter, uh, than the outside temperatures, and much cooler in the summer than the outside temperatures. But it's a very simple life, as you can understand. So we're there in that part of China meeting with uh, over 200 key church leaders who have gathered at risk of their going to jail, and in some cases risk of their life, to come and meet. And we're there doing some training with the shepherd staff and how to use it. Among them was a young Chinese girl she is 28 years old. She told me her story through some wonderful interpreters we had helping us there. In China, they are taught to give a tithe, every believer is taught to give a tithe of their life to the Lord. If they're going to live 70 years, what would be a tithe? Seven years. So they're taught to give not only a tithe of their finances, but a tithe of their life, their years to the Lord and do it as a first fruits, not the end of their life, at the beginning. So as soon as they finish their education at around age 20, 21, these young men and women will go out into the harvest to give their seven years. This young lady had left central China just eight years before I met her and gone up into the northeast near a city called Harbin. Some of you got to have a map of China. You can find it. It's north and east of, China, of uh, Beijing. I was in that city, in fact, uh, on my way to Russia in 1996. But in outside of Harbin, she was in a rural area, 
Now when she went, she had no sponsoring church, nobody to support her. She saved her own money, paid her own train fare, got up there, and what did she do? She went up there as a laborer. She went out into a rice field where they were gathering their harvest, and she said to the owner, <clears throat> or the one that was responsible, Sir, I would like to help you gather your harvest. Well, what do you require? She said, I don't require any money, but if you would just give me a bowl or two of rice a day to eat uh, and allow me to sleep on the berm. Do you know what a rice berm is? It's the part of the field that's above the water line, and the rice field itself usually can be wet or been harvested. Of course, they dry it out. But just let me sleep on the berm at night and let me have some of the rice to cook for my food. And that's all I'm asking. How many of you know almost any farmer would be happy to get that kind of labor? So he was delighted to have her help him gather his harvest. In the harvest were other laborers who were being paid or else were family members. They were very curious why she would come and offer herself as she did to gather the harvest. And she was able to tell them, I've come not only to gather this harvest, but I've come to gather another one. And you're it. You're the harvest. You're the ones I've come to gather. What do you mean? It opens the door for her to give the gospel. And usually within a week, she would have a convert, usually a woman, first of all, because she was a woman, and she could relate to the women better. And uh, when this first woman was converted, she would invite her to her home to sleep. Now, in China, in the poor areas, they all sleep on mud floors. It's not any big thing, you know, to be invited. But it got her out at least of where she was safer from attack, from rape, from other things that are risky and part of the risk of gathering a harvest. So now she has a place to sleep at night inside under a thatched roof. If it's raining, she'll be dry. There won't be any threats to her physical person. And in that home, she begins to share the gospel with others. And in a matter usually of a week to two weeks to three weeks, there will be an entire family that has made a commitment to Christ. She immediately starts training and equipping and them to do what she has done, to start sharing their faith with others. And so they go back out into the fields and they start sharing their faith. And in the course of a few months, they will have 30, 50, 60 believers, enough now for a house church, who will meet in someone's house. And they will have one copy of the Bible, usually among the whole 60 or 70 people. And now, many of them will have the shepherd's staff to help them understand the Bible. And she will train them up and go on and repeat that. Now, she started that process eight years before I met her. When I met her, she had 28,000 believers that she and those she had trained had won to Christ in 300 congregations in that part of China. One young woman. She didn't have any Bible school because there's no Bible schools to go to. She had a Bible and that was it. And she was begging, literally begging for 300 copies of the shepherd's staff for herself and they call them co-workers. For she and her co-workers and we said to her, we'd love to be able to promise you the 300 copies, but we've got, at that point, we had over 200,000 waiting for copies. And I said, we'll do our best to try to get them to you, but you know the problems. We have to carry them all in by hand across the border. Somebody has to put these in a bag and carry them across the border as luggage and hope they get through without being detected by the border guards. And once they're across the border, someone has to come by train for up to 2,000 miles they come from the far west of China to the east, southeast of China. Some of those leaders come over 2,500 miles to pick up a load of the shepherd's staff to get 30 or 40 copies to take back to the leaders in that part of China. Every province in China, they've come. We keep track of what provinces and what cities they go to. We don't keep track of names and addresses because that's too dangerous. If that fell into the hands of the communists, they'd arrest them all, throw them in jail. We don't want that to happen, so we said no database, no record of names and addresses. We don't want one started. It's too risky. Somebody will get a hold of it. It'll get in the wrong hands. We'll have a lot of Chinese pastors, uh, or house church leaders, rather, in jail. So we just want the city uh, and the province they go to, and we keep a record on that basis. And we put it on a, a map in our office so we know how many have gone into each province and each city. And in every province of China today, with the exception of Tibet, and there's just a few copies there, hundreds and hundreds, in some cases thousands, of, of house church leaders have received their copy of the shepherd's staff. And this one young lady 
one young lady who was willing to make the sacrifice and commitment, and she was only one of thousands who've done the same, went out and in eight years raised up 300 congregations with over 28,000 believers. Do you believe the harvest is great? What's few? The labors. Jesus did not say, pray the Lord of harvest that he'll send forth seminary graduates or that he'll send forth Bible school graduates or he'll send forth clergymen or preachers. He said, pray the Lord of harvest, he will send forth labors. And that's the first, 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 first thing that you must qualify as is a laborer, a laborer, somebody who's willing to work hard for Jesus. You remember when Jesus called Peter and John, what he found? He found some fishermen who had been working all night and caught nothing. What does that say to you about them? It says they were hard workers. They worked all night. It says they were persistent. They caught nothing and still were fishing. That's the kind of people God wants to use. Let me just close quickly, show you what's happened. Here is the world of 1980. Here's what is still before us, an unfinished task. 47% of the world still waiting for the gospel. Who is that 47%? Of whom do they consist? This is an exploded uh, bar chart of this pie. You can see the great percentage are still the Chinese. Even though 10% of China today is evangelical Christian, or near 10%, uh, there's still uh, over a billion Chinese outside the reach of the gospel. Muslims are the next biggest group, the Hindus of India the next biggest, and so on. And so well, we have a huge Christian contingency in the world today, but we still have a huge uh, group of people that are outside the reach of the gospel whom we need to reach. Let me just close then with this last transparency. I'll skip some of these others. This is the one that should be most encouraging to you. The number of evangelicals, let me slide it down, in millions in the West and non-West. World Map, the ministry that the Lord uses to raise up, started in 1961. So we're a 40 year old organization today. In 1960, when this chart begins, there were in Western nations, if you'll notice this dark blue line, there were a little over 50 million believers, born again believers in the nations of uh, Europe, Western Europe, the United States, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, Western nations. In third world nations, the nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, there were only 25 million born again believers in 1960. Now look what's happened in these 40 years. Here in the West, the evangelical community has grown from 50 million to a little over 100 million. That's a doubling. And how many say praise the Lord that we doubled in 50 years? But look what happened in Asia, Africa, and Latin America from 25 million believers up to 425 million believers in the year 2000. That's a 17-fold increase. And look how this line is going, almost straight up. What does that say to you? It says the harvest is great. The harvest is great. There's never been a time in history. People are turning to Christ, and according to the church advanced uh, published by the National Association of Evangelicals, the evangelical Christianity is growing three and a half times as fast as the world population today in 2001. The harvest is great, the labors are few. You say, well, Brother Ralph, what do I do about it? Well, I'll tell you what to do. Increase your giving, increase your going, and increase your praying. And pray the Lord of harvest that right here from Carbon Canyon Church, there will be laborers thrust forth into the harvest field. Pray the Lord of harvest that he will thrust forth labors, the King James Version says. Do you know what the literal translation is? Pray the Lord of harvest that he will cast out labors. It's the same Greek word used in Mark 16 when Jesus says, in my name shall they cast out devils. It means that it takes a forcible action of the Holy Spirit on somebody to kick them out there to get them to do it. We have to be cast out into the harvest. Most people will not voluntarily go and do the job. Pray the Lord of harvest that right here, the Lord of harvest will cast out some of these young people I'm looking at today and some of the older ones into the harvest. For the harvest truly is great and the labors are few. We've got plenty of clergymen, but not too many labors. 
Let's pray for the labor, shall we? Let's stand in his presence. And Brother Jim, you come. Lord, we pray today for the Lord of harvest. Send forth reapers. Hear us now to thee we cry. Send them forth, the fields to gather, ere the harvest time pass by. We must gather harvest in harvest time, and Lord, it is harvest time. So out of Carbon uh, Canyon Church, we pray today, Lord, for laborers to be cast out, young men, young women, older men, older women, to be cast out into the harvest fields of the world to help gather this great end-time harvest. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jim. That was good. Um, for those of you who would like to get your feet wet and be cast out, there's a mission outreach tonight in Long Beach, right? 